As long as computers have been stable enough to be useful, people have managed to find ways to cause problems. And one of the most effective ways to create mischief on a computer is through malware, like a computer worm or virus. Just like their biological analog, these types of programs will infect a computer before self-replicating by spreading themselves to other machines. Now, whatever prank was intended to be pulled can be run on hundreds or thousands or possibly even millions of computers, all because the program itself was designed to travel. While the idea of an autonomously self-replicating entity goes all the way back to the 1940s, it wouldn't be until the early 70s that such a program would actually exist. Created in 1971, the app we named Creeper was released onto the ARPANET, where it would bounce around between computers. The only trace it left was a message printed out onto the teletype terminal, reading, I'm the Creeper, catch me if you can. Later versions of the program would drop a copy of itself on the visited machine, making Creeper the first program to automatically spread copies of itself to other machines. In other words, the first computer worm. Eventually, the worm's creator, Ray Tomlinson, tired of the nuisance his program caused, created the world's second computer worm, Reaper, designed to clean up the mess that the Creeper had created across the network. Just a few years later, the first worm to appear in the wild would emerge, though, like the Creeper, Animal was never designed with ill intentions. Written in the era of text-based games, Animal was a popular program among Univac users, where the computer would try to guess what animal the user was thinking of through a series of yes or no questions. After improving the game with the ability to learn from users and expand its database of animals, John Walker received a ton of requests for the program, which he fulfilled through what he called a totally new way of distributing software. Walker added a routine to the program called Pervade, which, in the background as the user was playing, would make a copy of Animal to every folder the user had access to. In the case of a super user, the program would be able to copy itself to every directory in the system. And since tape sharing was a common practice between users at the time, Animal found its way onto systems where it had never even been requested in the first place. While mostly harmless, what eventually halted the spread of Animal was actually an unintended side effect of a system update. The Pervade routine had been designed to be as non-destructive as possible when copying itself, which meant that, upon reading the newly formatted system tables, it was unable to come up with any valid locations to copy itself into, effectively disabling its spread. One of the main reasons these worms were so effective was the fact that they were set loose on multi-user systems, meaning that a worm could either propagate by way of a network, like with Creeper, or through resources shared between users in the case of Animal. But that's not to say that personal computers were entirely immune to these types of programs. All it took was a small tweak in the mechanism they used to spread. Enter teenage Richard Skrenta, an Apple II enthusiast in 1982. At the time, networking between personal computers was still a rarity, so the primary medium by which shareware was distributed was Sneakernet, also known as copying that floppy and physically sharing it with someone else. Thing was, Skrenta had developed a reputation for enhancing the discs he shared, with rude comments and other pranks, to the point where nobody wanted to accept discs from him anymore. But Skrenta, a determined prankster, was not about to let such limitations stop him, and his efforts eventually resulted in the world's first computer virus. Unlike the worms described earlier, programs which copy themselves around, a virus spreads by inserting itself into another program. In the case of Skrenta's program Elk Cloner, the virus would add itself to the boot sector of the system disks used to boot the Apple II, which in turn would then add the cloner to every other disk loaded into the system. By writing into the boot sector, not only would the cloner run every time that disk was loaded, but it was also able to spread almost invisibly, only showing itself on every 50th boot, where it would display this poem. Four years later, on the other side of the world, a similar boot sector virus would appear on the IBM PC. Dubbed the Brain Virus after the company that created it, this virus listed the contact information of the two creators within the program. The original intent of this virus was to track how far it would spread to help understand the scope of software piracy. However, the two brothers were soon surprised to find out that their program had managed to cross the globe all the way over to the United States. The Brain Virus was largely benign, only meant to be an experiment, but it very quickly showed the potential widespread chaos a computer virus could cause with a more destructive payload. In the following years, the number of PC viruses would explode from a few isolated incidents to nearly 200 different pieces of viral code, many of which were not quite as friendly as Brainer Elk Cloner. 
Some did real damage, like overwriting fat tables on disks, and sometimes even going so far as to zero out the entire hard drive, effectively destroying whatever data it contained and spelling potential disaster for some businesses. One of the largest viral disasters of the time was the Morris Worm, released onto the internet in 1988 by Cornell grad student Robert Tapman Morris. Allegedly intended to highlight security flaws of the academic networks it had traveled to, the worm had an inadequate mechanism to prevent a machine from being infected multiple times. Not long after, an estimated 6,000 machines would be bogged down to the point of uselessness by the worm, accounting for about 10% of the entire internet at that time. The worm did damages on the order of thousands to millions of dollars, giving Morris one of the first high-profile convictions for the 1984 Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. By the late 80s, the first antivirus software had already arrived on the scene. Systems like FluShot would embed themselves within the operating system and alert the user any time a program attempted to modify another file. Another common tactic was to search files or the boot sector for specific signatures associated with a virus. In some cases, like the Macintosh program Virex, an antivirus program could also attempt to remove the bit of code injected by a virus. Of course, both of these tactics could be worked around. A virus could avoid detection while modifying a file by using a custom routine that went below the operating system, and with the introduction of polymorphic viruses like 1260, the code a virus added could be encrypted so that no two infections were alike. Another common tactic viruses used to stealthily spread across systems was to remain dormant until a specific date or event, such as the payload of the Friday the 13th virus. Similarly, on the days leading up to March 6, 1992, the Michelangelo virus, named after its activation date on the Renaissance painter's birthday, caused a mini Y2K-esque panic, as many computer users rushed out to buy antivirus software to protect themselves from the virus. In the end, the claims made by the various antivirus providers and news reports proved to be overstated. Of the potential millions of estimated infections, only a few thousand reports of damages were actually documented. By the mid to late 1990s, a new family of viruses had been discovered. Up to this point, Microsoft had been adding support for automation in MS Office through macros, small little programs that could perform routine tasks. As it turned out, the language these macros were written in was powerful enough that they could self-replicate. The very first macro virus, fittingly named Concept, was discovered in 1995. Rather than using shared software to spread, Concept would infect Word documents. Though this virus was mostly harmless, it did highlight an entirely new and much more dangerous vector for infection. After all, sharing files was far more common than sharing software, especially within businesses. And of course, what self-respecting malware of the time wouldn't take advantage of the biggest trend in technology during the 90s? The internet. Starting with Happy99, many viruses and worms would spread by email, taking advantage of human curiosity to be activated upon which they would mail themselves to whatever email contacts the program would find. Probably the most famous of these mischievous mass mailing malware menaces was the I Love You Worm in the year 2000. The worm, which spread by email, was presented as an attached love letter from the previously infected victim. The attachment was named loveletterforyou.txt.vbs, relying on the fact that Windows would truncate the rightmost extension of a file. To users who didn't give the message much thought, the file looked like a text file, and so they would unintentionally activate the worm. I Love You and its variants spread across the globe in mere hours on May 5th of the year 2000, causing an estimated 5 to 9 billion dollars in damages, from clogging internal mail servers to destroying files on host machines. A common thread among email worms was some form of social engineering, from the fireworks of Happy 99 to the intimate I Love You message. In order for the program to spread, it needed to encourage the user to activate it. That was until Blaster and Sasser came on the scene. Released less than a year apart from each other, these worms both made use of exploits within Windows XP in 2000 to spread themselves without any human intervention. This made them not only easy to catch, but also very hard to isolate, since they would continue to automatically spread until manually removed. Both Blaster and Sasser were interesting cases in that the exploits both took advantage of had been patched by Microsoft before the worms were even released. In fact, in the case of Blaster, another worm, Welchio, was released making use of the same exploit. Rather than cause mayhem though, the worm was designed to patch the system, as well as perform a Blaster worm disinfection. 
It's not all that often that you actually find a helpful worm, so thanks, Welchia. Of course, Welchia was not every IT department's cup of tea, since the worm wasn't that careful in applying its updates. Welchia didn't always manage to patch the system correctly, it generated traffic that brought many networks down, and at the end of the day, whether its intentions were good or bad, Welchia was still making modifications to other people's systems without permission. Kind of a no-no however you slice it. With new technologies came new vectors for infections, and a particularly unique method of propagation for malware online was through the search engine Google. The 2004 Santee worm, which infected websites powered by PHPBB, selected its targets by performing a Google search, with terms specifically designed to return a list of vulnerable pages. Of course, this meant that the spread of the worm was pretty quickly halted when Google blocked the specific search query the worm used. Overall, viruses have mostly trended away from being mindlessly destructive to being destructive in financially effective ways. Case in point, WannaCry, an example of ransomware back in 2017. The worm once again proved that malware was certainly capable of causing significant financial damage to a target, but it went one step further by also causing significant financial gains to its creator. Ransomware like WannaCry encrypts a user's data demanding a Bitcoin payment in order for the data to be safely decrypted and returned. Whether or not that end of the deal is held up is not necessarily guaranteed, though. Allegedly, the creators of WannaCry made around $140,000 from ransom payments made through their worm, and inspired similar ransomware programs like Pecha and Thanatos in the following years. And here we are now. Viruses and worms still remain a threat to many a computer around the globe especially those running end-of-life software, but thankfully, keeping your system up to date and simply being cognizant of how computers can be infected can greatly minimize your risk of ever having to deal with these types of programs. Computer worms are nearly 50 years old now, and while it is a shame that they've transitioned from the out-of-control experiments and mostly harmless pranks to software near universally viewed as a nuisance, the evolution of the different ways these programs manage to get around is an interesting one. And past that, there is something kind of charming about a combination of bits and bytes that, under the right circumstances, can travel the globe with no human intervention, visiting all sorts of systems along the way. One can only hope, though, that the worms and viruses of the future come in peace.